How is your relationship with God and with His Word doing? Would you say that it is in a healthy place? As Pastor Tony began last week, uh, we're beginning this sermon series focusing on Psalm 119. Uh, as Tony, Pastor Tony began last week, so we continue on this week. And this psalm has a lot to say about God's Word, as well as our relationship to His Word. Uh, as John MacArthur says in his commentary as well, this psalm is connected with some other psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 19 especially, as Pastor Tony did talk about last week. And here in this psalm, we need to remember that there's these eight different terms that you hear that are referring to Scripture, God's Word, uh, law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, word, and ordinances. Throughout the psalm, we hear these different uh, words referring to Scripture, referring to God's Word. And actually, this morning in the stanza that we're going to be looking at, we'll hear a lot of these words mentioned. So as we continue on in Psalm 119 this morning, consider these words from the study notes in the ESV as I prepared that I found that this is the psalm, Psalm 119, is the psalm that celebrates the gift of God's Torah or God's law or God's covenant instruction, God's covenant instruction as the perfect guide for life. So this psalm and this stanza especially, the second stanza that we'll be looking at this morning, show that if one desires to live a true, if one desires to live a righteous life, they must be focused on God's word. That His Word would be in their life. That His Word would be on their heart. And that His Word would be spilling out of their mouth. So let's read together Psalm 119, verses 9 to 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. And as I read these words as I was preparing this week, it reminded me of the words that we see in Deuteronomy so I'm just going to read a couple verses from there. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 to 20, before we get right into it. So Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 to 20, where it says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. There's just a couple of verses there that as reading this stanza kind of reminded me of. So I just thought it was important to briefly look there. And as it says there in Deuteronomy, that God's word should be a part of our everyday life. From when you wake up to when you lay down at night, God's word should be our number one focus. And then as we get into this stanza here, as we get into verse 9 of Psalm 119, it says, If a young man wants to keep his way pure, he should guard it according to God's word. But how can you guard your life according to God's word if you don't know it? So this is why it's so important to consider God's word, to consider our relationship with his word, and consider in our own lives, do we cherish God's word? And thinking of what Pastor Tony mentioned as we prayed and what they talked about last week in countries like North Korea where these people, in order to even have a chance to read God's Word, they bury their Bible in their garden it's just so that they can go, they can dig it up, read it for an hour at night, then bury it again because if they get caught with it, they'll be either murdered or sent to prison. Do we sometimes maybe take for granted the fact that we can read God's Word, that we have access to His Word anytime we want it? So do we cherish God's Word? Do we meditate on His Word? And is God's Word a regular part of our everyday life? These are some of the things that I hope that we consider, not only today, but as we go through this whole series on Psalm 119. So as it says here again, if we want to keep our way pure, we must live according to His Word, according to God's Word, 
But again, if His Word is not a part of our lives, this would be quite impossible. And again, I know that it can be easy to take it for granted, to take God's Word for granted, even as a pastor. Of course, by our work, by my work, naturally I'm going to be in the Word. But at the same time, I admit that there are times that I take it for granted, or times in my life when I just treated reading God's Word like another task on the to-do list, just to get it done, check it off, and move on to the next thing. But is this what God wants for us? Is, does He want us to treat spending time with Him in His Word as just another task, or as just another chore to complete? I don't think so. And thinking about this, I thought of interacting with another person, interacting with a person who's very narcissistic or very self-centered. When you try to talk to them, you can't even get a word in. Or if you do, it's like a chore for them to hear what you have to say before they simply just move on to the next thing and go right back to talking about themselves. Yet if we are honest with ourselves, this is how we act in our relationship with God so many times. We live our lives according to our desires. We live our lives according to what we want to do. And as I said, we might just treat His Word as just another task, just another chore to get done before we can go back to doing what we want and go back to talking about ourselves doing what we want. But here's the amazing part about our God. For in this analogy that I shared, think about it. How would you act towards that selfish person that you tried to have a conversation with? Probably moving forward, you probably wouldn't really want to have many conversations with them. In fact, you might cut them out of your life completely and not even interact with them at all. But what does God do when we live our self-centered lives, when we care for ourselves first? What does God do? He loves us. He calls us back. That even when we are faithless towards God, God is faithful towards us and thank Him for that. I know this is something that I have been so thankful for throughout my life in many different ways. For the many times when I was faithless and showed no desire for God, He did not cast me aside. So then we come to verse 10, where it says, With my whole heart I seek you. And I think as we look through these verses, as we journey through Psalm 119, not only today but in the days to come, we can really check up on our own lives, check our own lives against these verses, against the things that we see here, and we can consider how, how are we doing in our relationship with God? Does our relationship with God look like what we hear in these verses? How are we seeking to grow deeper and to grow in our relationship with God? What things could we change in the way that we are acting towards God? So here we can ask ourselves, as we see in verse 10, are we seeking the Lord with our whole heart? I know that personally I hear those words, those words, not words, and I feel instantly convicted. I think of the ways that my own heart is divided, and I'm sure many of us could admit the same. So how can we get to this place where our whole heart is seeking after the Lord, where our lives, our focus, our time is dedicated to God? If we want the answer, a good place to look is the second half of this same verse, verse 10, where it says, Let me not wander from your commandments. And as this stanza obviously is spoken to the Lord, as we are looking at your word, speaking you towards the Lord, the author is asking the Lord to not let him wander from his commandments. So the focus here is not on the author's effort. As so many times when we are in a place where we're struggling with our faith, we think it's about us, we got to do more, we got to do this, we got to do that. The, that's not what the author is saying. He's asking the Lord to help him to not wander from his commandments. If we rely on our own strength, if we rely on our own effort to grow in our faith, we will fail. For our sinful flesh is waiting to satisfy our own desires, not the Lord's desires. So may we ask the Lord, as the author here does, help us to not wander from your commandments. Help us not to wander from your word. Help us not to wander from you, Lord. But lead us to you, Lord God. May we know your love. May we know your goodness. May we know your faithfulness. And may our greatest desire be to draw near to you, Lord. To come before you, God, 
to sit at your feet, desiring to learn from you and to grow in our relationship with you. May this be our true heart's desire. So now we look to verse 11. We continue on. And again, this verse here where it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It harkens back to the verses I read from Deuteronomy. That the words of the Lord would be laid up in your heart. That the words of the Lord would be laid up in your soul. For if we have God's word in our heart, if we know his word, it can speak to the temptation that we face, as it says here, that we might not sin against him. So as I read this verse, I thought of the temptation of Jesus. So let's briefly turn there. Matthew chapter 4. And look at the temptation of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Okay, reading again, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command your angels concerning you, and on, your, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your feet against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So as we see here, and we can think about our own lives, how does Jesus stand in the face of temptation from the devil? How does he respond? He speaks the scripture that he knows. Remembering and speaking, obviously he knows the word of God. And speaking the word of God that stands in the face of sin, that stands in the face of temptation. So in the same way, if we know God's word, if we memorize it, if we have the word of God in our lives, in our heart, in our soul, in our mind. When we face difficulties, when we face hard times, when we face loss, when we face temptation... If we know God's word, we can remember his word that speaks into that situation. His word that is living and active and speaks into these situations. So the question for us is, as we consider this, do we know God's word? When someone asks us something to do with the Lord, do we know where to look in the Bible? Do we know where to point them to? When we face trials in our lives, do we have the word of God in our heart? to help us combat the temptation that we face? Do we know His Word? Do we love His Word? Do we cherish His Word? And if the answer is no to these questions, as I said, this is a chance to check ourselves, to check our own lives, to consider where we are at in our walk with God and how we can change. And may we ask God to give us a renewed love, a renewed desire for His Word that we would turn there before anywhere else. In this past week, I saw a video, uh, I think it was on Instagram, I was looking, and it showed where it substituted the Bible for a person's phone. So instead of picking up your phone first thing when you wake up in the morning, it would be your Bible. Instead of scrolling through our phones mindlessly, we we're looking through our Bible, looking through God's Word. And so maybe... and. Maybe that's not an appropriate analogy for you. Maybe it's not your phone that you're always on. Of course, it can be a, more of a generational thing. But whatever it is for you, the first place that you turn, maybe it's another book, maybe it's television, whatever it might be for you, whatever takes your time and attention, imagine how different our lives would look if the first thing that we would turn to was the Word of God. In our waking, in our sleeping, in our free time, if God's word was the first place that we looked, the first thing that we would pick up, how would our lives look? And why isn't that a reality for us? 
And of course, again, this is a question that I have for myself first. Ironically enough, I saw this video as I was scrolling through Instagram. So I guess that's uh, speaking to me first, obviously. But I encourage you to ask yourself as well. And again, to ask the Lord to ignite that fire and that passion in your heart for His Word. That He and His Word would always be our first love, our first and greatest desire as we consider these words again. So now looking at verse 12, we see the author again ask the Lord to help him. As he first says, blessed are you, O Lord. And then secondly, in the second half, teach me your statutes in verse 12. So first, again, he praises the Lord and then he asks God to teach him. So do we rely on the Lord to teach us his word? Do we rely on the Holy Spirit to illuminate God's word as we read it? And again, remember these multiple words that we see here referring to God's word. Commandments, statutes, testimonies, precepts, etc. And thinking of these words, especially in this first part where it just simply says, Blessed are you, O Lord. I think of the time looking at the Lord's Prayer as I preached a few weeks ago. And I've also been working with the youth here. That at the start of the prayer, we recognize God for who He is. That we recognize God that He is Lord. That He is our Creator, that He is Sustainer, that God is love, that He is faithful, that He is holy, that He is unchangeable, that He is good. We recognize that He is just. And again, I could go on and on speaking who God is and the attributes that He has. But do we worship and do we recognize Him for who He is regularly as we come before Him? And then secondly, again, do we rely on Him to teach us His Word, to teach us more about Him? So now we come to verse 13. We've made it past the halfway mark. And we kind of see this progression here throughout the passage. Where at the start we saw that we are to live life according to God's word. That we are to live according to his word and not wander from his commandments. And second, we heard that we are to store up his word in our hearts. And we are to ask the Lord to teach us more about him, more about his word. And now here in verse 13, we see that he wants to declare the rules, that he wants to declare the words from God and share it with others. For the word of God is not only to influence ourselves, it's not meant to be kept to ourselves. That is where it begins, of course, as we've looked again through this progression, that's where it begins. But God's word must also flow out of us. For God's word is for all people. And it should impact us. It should fill our lives so much that we want to share it with all people. That it would spill out of our lives from the abundance that is in us. For if we allow God's word to truly impact us, if we allow God's word to truly infiltrate and fill our hearts and our minds, we will not be able to keep it to ourselves. And why would we want to keep it to ourselves? So we continue on. Verse 14, we see, In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. So we ask ourselves, do we cherish God's word above money? Or you could substitute other things in that place. Anything that might be an idol, anything that might take God's rightful place in our lives, anything that might divide our heart, could be money, it could be possessions, it could be family, it could be fame, it could be entertainment, whatever it is for you, put that in that place. Do we cherish God's word above whatever it is for you? (coughs) Excuse me. Do we find delight in the Lord? Do we find delight in His word more than anything else? Again, this is another place where we can check our own lives and consider possible changes we would need to make where we would put God's word above whatever that is in our life that divides our heart. Now we come to verse 15, where it says, I will meditate on your precepts. I will fix my eyes on your ways. (coughs) Do we meditate on God's word? That's a question I asked near the beginning of the sermon, and now we consider this again. And considering what it means to meditate on God's Word, I looked at an article from John Piper, which was an excerpt from a sermon, where he spoke about this. That he said, The word meditation in Hebrew means basically to speak or to mutter. When this is done in the heart, it is called musing or meditation. Meditation. 
So meditating on the Word of God day and night means to speak to yourself the Word of God day and night and to speak to yourself about it. But unless you memorize Scripture, unless you know God's Word, you will not meditate on it day and night. So what is hour by hour walking in fellowship with the living God? The answer is it is His speaking to you by His Word through your memory and meditation and illumination and application, and you're speaking to him words of thanks and praise and admiration and desire and seeking for help and guidance and understanding. So this is what John Piper says about meditation on God's word. So I ask you again, do we meditate on God's word? And second, do you know his word? Because if you don't know his word, if you don't regularly spend time in his word, it's impossible to meditate on his word. And finally, as we come to verse 16, as it says, that His Word would be our delight. That we would not forget or neglect His Word, but that it would be the center of our life. That His Word would inspire us. That God's Word would sustain us. That His Word would lead us, teach us, guide us, and spill out of us as we interact with other people. Doesn't this sound like a blessed life? Is this our desire, though? that His Word would be the center of our lives. And if not, as I've said throughout this sermon, that if this is not our highest desire, we should come humbly before the Lord and ask Him to create this deeper desire in our hearts for God. That He would create this deeper desire in our hearts for His Word. And less for the things of the world that distract us. So as we go from here this morning, as we continue to progress through Psalm 119 in this sermon series, I hope that we all will consider God's Word. Are we truly letting His Word shape us in our lives? Are we living according to His Word? Do we have His Word in our heart and mind that we can go to it when we face temptation? Do we share His Word with others? out of the overflow of our own heart, that it would spill out of us as we speak with others? Do we meditate and spend time in His Word regularly? And is the Lord and His Word our first and highest delight and desire? These are the kind of things that I hope that we can take from this passage today. Let's pray together. Lord God, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this chance to continue to look into your word. And not only to look into your word, but as we look at Psalm 119, we consider our relationship with your word, Lord God. We consider if we truly do love you, if we truly do love your word more than anything else, God. And I pray that we may be challenged (coughs) and humbled by this thought this morning. That if you are not our highest desire, Lord, that we would consider what we need to change in our life, Lord. And not just what we need to change in ourselves, but that we would humbly come before you. And ask that you would create that desire in our hearts. Or renew that desire in our hearts for you and for your word, Lord God. So we just thank you so much for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen.